So hello and welcome to the Lewis Nichols Show. I'm really excited to bring on my next guest today. Um, I know many of you uh, missed her at the reunion, but luckily here for a solo chat with us, the brilliant Sarah Jane Potts. How are you? Hello. I'm <laughs> fine, thank you. So good. I'm genuinely so excited to have you on because not I've got loads to talk to you about your career, but I loved Joe Lipset in um, Waterloo Road. She was one of my favourite characters because you've had this incredible kind of comedy relationship with Denise, who of course played mm -hmm. Steph. Um, what was it? First of all, uh, how did you get the part in the show? Did you audition for it or were you asked to go on? No, I auditioned. I went to an audition. And at the time, I'd done another project. And I remember I had um, I had really short bleach blonde hair, which didn't look, it didn't look professional in any capacity. Certainly didn't look like a teacher. Uh, and I went and auditioned. And I remember that audition went really, really badly. I mean, really badly. Probably <laughs> one of the worst ones I've ever done. And I just thought, oh, oh that's, it's over. It's, it, uh, it's just not gonna happen. And then I got a call from Sharon, who was the, uh, one of our producers at the time. And she said, look, I, I think you're really right for this, but you look completely wrong. And she said, I need to persuade people. And also your audition was terrible. So would you come back and would you audition again? And would you wear a wig? I said, what, uh, what do you mean? She went, just something really simple, some like little brown wig so that I can show our execs that you can look like a teacher and just not one of the pupils. I went, okay, so I went and I did it again and I wore a wig. <laughs> I, wow. I, and then they offered it to me. So was that the only thing that what when you said it was kind of like a, a disaster? So what went wrong in the audition? I was with... shit. Oh, I was really, really bad. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, I, you know, you just you know you're not doing very well, and you can feel it. And I don't know whether you've had, ever had that situation where you just start to get really hot, like your body temperature changes, and you're yeah. very aware of yourself, and you're very aware of your surroundings, and you're being anything but entertaining or spontaneous. And I could just feel this kind of heat creeping up. And I can remember sort of looking down and I'd gone all blotchy and I was like, oh my God. And then, because I was just embarrassed that I was being so bad. I don't know why, some days are just like that. It's not, it's not a regular thing for actors, but sometimes you're just not, it's just not the right day. You know, we, yeah. you have other stuff going on in your life and you can't switch it off enough just to be able to go into this room and impress everybody. Yeah, so I just drowned a little bit and I knew I drowned, that was the worst thing. And I, I just, I can remember going to the toilets afterwards and looking at my face and my face was all blotchy, like I'd been crying and it, yeah, it was just, it was me being bad, just being a shit actor. <laughs> wow, thank God that you, you ended up getting that chance to put on the wig because you were just incredible. When you came in, I mean, everything about uh, Joe Lips, that she was this high flyer, had great career prospects. Um, she was good at her job. And then you flip over to the staff member that she's, uh, she has to look after Steph Haydock, who wasn't very professional, um, didn't really know what she was doing and was out of her depth. And then now she's got this person that's kind of... Yes. She... I mean, that, the thing... Not what... really homophobic. She was, she didn't realise that her, what, right. that her attitude was homophobic. And she thought she could kind of flirt her way uh, into keeping yeah. her job. And you, you were just this great character that were you were able to read what she was doing and play her, her own game. Did you like, when you read about the character and the type of character she was, did you like that? Because she was just great. She didn't take any nonsense from anyone. Yeah, I, li I like those kind of women. I mean, who yeah. doesn't... Um, well, I could think of quite a lot of people that don't actually, but... <laughs> <laughs> father right women um yeah of course I, I think at that point as well in my career I think I was very I was very uh, inspired and wanting to play very strong women 
intelligent women, articulate women, women that had something to say, something to stand up for. Um, so she kind of, she sort of fit the bill perfectly. I remember being terrified though, because she was, if I remember rightly, it's so long ago now, she was the head of languages. Yeah. So that tends to mean that you can speak quite a few languages fluently, not just one. You have a grasp of, usually from what I looked into, four or five languages. So that I remember, I was like, oh shit, at some point. Oh, sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to say That's fine, that. yeah, we're not, we're not live. <laughs> um, so I, at some point I thought they're gonna, I'm gonna be teaching a class and it's gonna be a language class and yes, it would happen and there'd be big chunks of Spanish and French. I think there was Italian at some point and something else. I was like, oh my God, because <laughs> it's your nightmare when you don't speak any languages because it's incredibly difficult to learn. And you like anything that is a like a medical dramas or anything factual with with words in that we're not used to saying on a daily basis. You just have to learn them phonetically, and then try and make it sound like you know what you're doing. Uh, so those were the bits that I remember. Every everything else about it I loved, but those bits I was like, oh shit, okay. I mean, that's interesting. Well, you had your fair share of storylines because one of the big stories was uh, Tom Chambers, who played a character of Max Tyler, who was this superhead that was just so egotistical. He was manipulative. He was playing people. And the great thing about your character is you could see through that. You know, you weren't kind of swayed by him. And then you had the storyline where a student had a crush on um, Miss Lit. And that was a huge story. So you, when you took on this role, you were given some really big storylines to kind of go out there and and do and this was a well-established show when you actually joined so is that ever as an actress daunting when you join such a popular show and then get thrown in with you know big storylines or do you kind of thrive off that i sort of thrive off that personally i'm not speaking for anybody else but i don't think at the time i don't think i knew what all, I, I sort of I've, I've been given an inkling about what the arcs of her character might be, but I don't think I actually knew in detail. I'd not read all of the scripts because I don't think they had them all. So I don't think I knew the extent to what was going to happen in her storylines until we were much closer to shooting it. Yeah. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't think I knew quite to the extent that she was going to have that sort of impact at the time. But I love that. It, it's so much more interesting to, to, be challenged and well, to go and try and try and bring it was it was it your decision to leave because i was genuinely and i know many other people are i was so gutted when the next series was on and then you weren't there because we had just got to really know and love this character and then she was gone and you, you had so much strength as a character so was that your choice to leave or did they feel they ran out of steam with the character like how did that happen i uh, it was a mixture of of both things like I that time when they finished that series the next series was going to be in Cardiff um so they changed location because this one this one was in the original school that they used to shoot in Rochdale oh uh, Scotland I, they moved it to they moved, yeah, yeah no. I didn't I didn't want to make that move I had a I had a young child and I just didn't want to I didn't want to do that um so we kind of mutually agreed that she wouldn't she'd be off <laughs> gone well, you broke a lot of hearts because you were just fantastic uh, in that role. But I wanted to, uh, for you really, which kind of going back to uh, the beginning, uh, where your love for, for acting and performing came from, because your brother, you know, is also an actor as well. So did you come from like a kind of family of arts? You know, where, where did that kind of inspiration come from? No, no family of arts. We were just a regular working just... class family from Bradford. Um, I just wanted attention. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's not it's not that difficult to figure out. Every every single one of my report cards always says this child desperately seeks attention, and I was either put to the front of my class a lot, or put to the back of my class a lot, and I just find ways to <laughs> annoy people and question people and have my voice heard. Um, so, and I don't I don't know I don't exactly know what that is or why that happened, but that I think the need to have attention and to and when I got that attention I felt validated and I liked that I liked that feeling so not to say I don't 
<laughs> I didn't love drama and I didn't love acting. It just seemed, it seemed like a really, the two things clicked when I started to do drama. And I went to a little drama class and realized that we'd do things where you would then show an audience. That was a lot of attention and applause, you know, so that just seemed like a no brainer to me as a child. I think that if that's the vocation I followed, if that's what I did, not only did I love doing it, I loved the response it elicited from other people. So yeah, kind of that, I think that's, that's where it started. It's not like, I mean, I went to the theatre quite a lot as a child with my Nana, which was the old Alhambra then before it was redone. And I can remember loving what I went to see. Um, but I think when, you know, where I was from and my career prospects were quite limited. And I just didn't ever think, God, I can, I wanted to, but I didn't ever think, God, I can get away and I can really, really do this. I, I didn't see a way from transposing myself from the person watching the TV to being essentially the person on the TV. I couldn't quite conceptualize that. Um, but have I answered that question? I'm yeah, sorry. no, you have, but I, I, I was going <laughs> to also say, cause you just touched upon it there. And when I speak to actors, it seems like it's such a difficult job in a sense, whereas a lot of auditioning, sometimes you don't even hear back um, from that audition. So when was that moment when you decided to actually pursue this as your career like was there a moment where you thought I'm going to put everything into this because it takes a lot of hard work to, to get that first step I mean from speaking to people that have been on the show before I think the one thing you have on your side hugely when you're a young adult is you have no fear and you also usually have an incredible overinflated sense of self as a teenager and those two things are quite a good quite a good match when you are putting yourself out into the world because you sort of throw yourself out there fearlessly thinking that not that the world owes you a living I never thought that but thinking well why not yeah. you know uh so no fear coupled with why not was was quite a potent um what do you call it catalyst but I think when I when I do look back because I've been doing lots of amateur stuff from being I guess 10 being 14 I was involved a lot within my community and what my community did in Bradford and I'd had quite a lot of brilliant experiences like going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and things like that so I was already circulating within that world but in, in an amateur sense and I loved it I just felt I really felt like I could be myself it was an environment that I felt comfortable yet challenged in and so when I was sent to my high school, you know, it was that point where parents didn't move to an area so their kids could go to a certain school. You just went to the school that came on the letter and you got it through the post. And mine was a, a very bad school. It was a very, 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 very bad high school. And I spent a year there and I hated it. One of those places where you, you just had to adapt to whoever you were around and it wasn't in a positive way you know you couldn't if you were clever and you wanted to work you had to hide it because you had to be a follower and fit in so you didn't get bullied or picked on or singled out um and I knew I didn't want to stay there and I also had the foresight to know that I probably would have fallen in with a bad crowd I didn't if I'd have stayed there wasn't really a choice and I because of my friends that I did a lot of drama with and stuff. I, I had friends that went to a school in Leeds that was a regular school, um, the same school that Angela went to, but it ran a performing arts course alongside it. So it was national curriculum. And then there were kids there that were on the performing arts course too. You didn't pay, but you had to audition to get onto the course. And the deal was that you had to completely keep up with all your academic studies. And if, if any of that fell by the wayside your privileges would be revoked in terms of you couldn't do drama and you couldn't be in the productions and this that, and the other. but I remember asking my parents if I'd go see the show that they were doing the end of year show which happened to be Jesus Christ Superstar my my friend Paul was playing Jesus <laughs> and we went and I do remember that as kind of a light bulb moment of sitting in the audience and realizing that this was just actually a normal school but the quality of the show 
and of the kids and it was so high and the talent was so strong I just felt like I it sounds really cheesy I felt like I'd found home yeah I knew at that moment that I had to do whatever I had to do to get to that school I didn't have a plan beyond that but I think that was the beginning of throwing everything I had into doing what I wanted to do because I had to change schools I had to fight to move from from one city to another I had to find my own funding I had there was a lot of things I had to do to get to that school and then that paved the way for a lot of other kids that ended up going to that school and leaving and being really successful within the entertainment industry uh so I think then at that point of 14 I was really determined and, and we were lucky then because it was a school that had a reputation for having talented kids so when Yorkshire Television was still a thing and when Granada was still a thing because they were relatively local, because we were only in Leeds, they'd send their casting directors to come and watch our drama classes and our shows and stuff. Because everyone wants local raw talent. They want to be able to go, yeah, I'm the one that found that person. And I ended up, my first professional gig was doing Children's Ward. I don't know if you remember that show. I've heard of it from other guests that have been on, but I, I wasn't You're so quite... young and I'm so old. <laughs> so this is, we're talking 93. And at the time it was, for what it was, it was as popular as Grange Hill and, uh, and as good, just it had, and it was Russell T. T. Davis that wrote it. So you can imagine what the storylines were like. Uh, they didn't hold back in any way, even though it was a kid's show. I mean, my, my, my main storyline, I had two main storylines. One was about being abandoned because she was a foster kid and she was always trying to look for her, her, her real mother. And when her real mother showed up, she realized that she didn't like her, that she didn't actually want to be taken care of by her. She wasn't a stand-up woman. And my biggest storyline was that she fell in love with a boy that was on the ward, a Jewish boy that had AIDS. And mm -hmm. she didn't know at the time, and the first time they go to kiss, he has to say to her, look, I, I have this disease, this is what I have. And at that time, people weren't, people weren't talking about AIDS, let alone having a, a, a show that highlighted a child having AIDS and then what do you do when that when well that when, when that young adult wants to be involved in a in a sexual relationship with another young adult so it was really kind of hard-hitting drama disguised in this show for kids uh, so I did that that was my first big gig and I got that through my school because they came to watch drama sessions and they took pictures of us all then I ended up having to go and meet Russell and read script and do all that stuff. So that was my first professional paid in a studio telly gig. And I was 16 because I was waiting for my GCSE results to come in that well, summer. I was going to say, the rest followed from Children's Ward. So then working yeah. on one of the most popular wards on TV, of course, 10 years ago now, uh, when you joined Holby City. What uh, is it I, 10 years ago? I can't bear it. <laughs> I'm out the window, I can't handle it. Oh but what God. I loved uh, about it was, again, you played one of those no-nonsense, uh, in a powerful oh, yeah, he was ladies. Favorite. She was and, and you were in the show for just over a year, yet you are deemed as one of the most iconic characters on the show. And that just says about how much you did in that amount of time, because you went in there and just changed everything. And I remember, just before you joined it, I was falling slightly out of love with the show. And then when you came in, you played the character that I love to watch and then it, that's that's what got me watching it again was actually you joining the show so I wanted to to ask you what it was like to, to join that show because it's one of the most popular uh, BBC programs you know of all time so you must have been thrilled to have a regular part. I was although at that point it was the first kind of long-running show I'd ever done with it was the longest contract I'd ever signed because I signed for a year so I was a little bit terrified of that because I think I had a real fear. I'd had a real fear throughout my entire career of being typecast, uh, which is sort of started to happen. It was like I'd played, because I'd played a lesbian in Sugar Rush, suddenly everything that was been sent to me was to do with lesbians. I was like, no, I just want to keep, I want to keep, I don't want to be typecast. I don't want to be pigeonholed. Yeah. Who, who does, even in regular life? Uh so the, the, the long running thing scared me a bit because I'd never stayed in one place for more than a couple of months. I liked to hop on to different jobs all the time. But I ended up actually loving it. I loved the feeling of having a community and 
that when you stay somewhere for long enough and you get to know the writers and they get to know you they they write to your strengths so it was a process of Eddie evolved as the longer I stayed on that show. I mean, she was very forthright in the beginning. She was very no nonsense and very forthright, but they were able to start incorporating more of my humor into her humor and my timing into her timing. And it just becomes kind of a symbiotic thing, which I think can only happen when you give something time for it to grow. So I loved it. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't nervous about going on and doing it, but it being such a, well-received long-running show I was just I was excited to just have another job I think I seem to remember though like you said it's 10 years ago so <laughs> I quite remember exactly what my action was but I, the, the way they put it to me one of my favorite shows at the time I don't know whether you've ever seen it, it's called Nurse Jackie no I haven't it's an amazing show with an amazing American actress older actress called Edie Falco who was in The Sopranos actually um and they put it to me like Eddie was going to be Nurse Jackie and this was a woman who had serious addiction issues with pharmaceuticals but was amazing at her job um, and I, I loved the idea of sort of having a go at playing that because I like I said Nurse Jackie was one of my favorite shows of all time and Edie Falco did it with such subtlety and grace and talent I thought my god if I can even be a fragment do a, bring to it a fragment of what she did to her show then I'll be happy yeah. well, do, do you know what I was going to say in regards to your, your time on Holby City is sometimes on a long running show like that a, a character will get a big storyline and then you don't hear from them for, for a few months and then they get another big storyline but I felt with your character they ran with some really strong stories for your entire time. And we saw some vulnerabilities to the character at times, which kind of explained why sometimes she was the way that she, she is. You, you saw that there was a softer side. And I love the development of the character. And I think that's what the, the show did really well with you. Um, what was your favourite storyline? Because you went through drug addiction, you went through love. There was so much that you did in just one year. Uh, similar to Waterloo Road, every show you do, they just give you kind of 10 years worth of stories oh, and yeah. there you go and, and run with it. So what was one of your favourite standout moments? It wasn't, it wasn't like the really big storylines. It was more to do with the day-to-day -day running of the ward and her relationship with Luke Hemingway, Joseph Milson, and, and with Sasha, who was Bob Barrett. And just they were a team they were like they were like this really dysfunctional three musketeers kind of thing and they were they were all lacking in some way but together they were a really quite efficient team on that ward and i loved the i loved the dark humor and i loved the quips and the kind of snidey remarks and the comments and sort yeah. of all of the um the foundations of making a character really real and I, I just, I, I liked playing her when she was grumpy. That was one of my favorite things to do, <laughs> grumpy. And she didn't give a shit and you got it regardless of whether you were a patient, whether you were her supervisor, her senior, it didn't matter. She didn't change for other people, which I loved. If she was in a bad mood, you were gonna know it. And that was it. But you couldn't really do anything about it because she was so good at her job. So she didn't let that part of her down. She was professional, apart from when she was doing the drugs and stuff, and then it all got a bit, you know, got a bit hairy, didn't it? Uh, I, think <laughs> I think mistakes started to happen then. But up until that point, she was just so very good at her job. So what are you going to say to someone? You're great at your job, but you annoy me. Yeah, she annoyed everybody. I liked that. She didn't give a shit. She knew she annoyed people, and she didn't feel like she had to make amends for that. So that was, I think that was my favorite through line running through all of it but you know when you watch a show nowadays whether it's holby city eastenders you know a, a long uh, running drama you know when someone's going to leave you read it and you, you expect it you know you kind of wait for that exit storyline we had absolutely no warning when it came to to you leaving it was like whoa hang on a minute why wasn't that in the the soap magazines or the the daily mirror we didn't hear nothing was that a kind of plan because it was yeah, they, the didn't first... want it. they didn't want it to be they didn't want people no yeah i mean it was a big seat and that was it was good to have watch a program again and be surprised by it you know to to have that element of shock which we used to have 
uh, you know, years ago. So when they came to you and, and said, this is the exit storyline, we're keeping it under wraps, were you kind of excited about that added element of shock and surprise to the viewers? To be honest, I don't think I really thought about it. Because when you're doing Holby, you work so hard. Yeah. You don't really, and it's so fast. You don't really, I think all I used to think about was learning my lines, doing my job properly, and going upstairs to the room where we used to have all the, all our schedules written out and seeing when I next had a holiday. <laughs> next get a day off. Oh, there, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I guess, I can't really remember. I think I thought it was a very fitting, it was a very fitting storyline and very interesting way for her to leave, especially as, because Joe stayed on for a few months longer to play Luke and I loved how they tied it up. I don't know whether you ever saw his last episode, but his final episode, he drives off to find Eddie. That's what he's decided he's going to do. He's not going to work there anymore. He gets in his van and there's a postcard that he's been, he's been sent. They planted it. So just when I'd left in one of the episodes, there was a postcard that his character and Bob Barrett's character received from me from India. And then at the end of Joe's storyline was that that postcard was in his in his camper van and he pulled it out and he looked at it and he drove off like into the sunset. As if he was going to go off and try and find her and tell her tell her that he loved her and you know fairy tale that we all love forever. <laughs> not that you'll ever know whether they ever made it or not <laughs> the great thing about you is how versatile you are for me as an actor and when i announced that you were coming on the show i had different people message me said oh my god i loved her in holby loved her in sugar rush and i mean sugar rush as well has become over time especially i feel more and more iconic and I've had so many friends message me saying um, when they, they saw the announcement I was going to have you on the show, said, oh, my God, I loved her in Sugar Rush. So does it ever surprise you that some of the shows that you've done, you know, years ago keep getting new audiences? You know, they, they discover it online and then fall in love with it, even though it was, I mean, 15, ye 15 years or so. Stop now. Stop now with the years thing. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years, 15 years. I'm like, holy shit. I'm going to end up with like 75. Yeah, you know when you first did that job in 1961? Mm. My God. <laughs> A couple of years ago. <laughs> ago. That, that sits better. That's, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm always thrilled. I'm thrilled. I'm grateful. I'm really flattered when people, when there's a, a new resurgence of something that I've done quite a long time ago and it finds a new audience because I think that just validates that it's a good story. Yeah. Well, we've yeah. spoken enough about your incredible past, recent past. Um, I want to move on to the future now, which is kind of what's next for you now, because I know that productions are only just starting to, to get back up with the easing of restrictions. So uh, can we expect any projects that you're able to tell us about um, at the moment? Well, I just had one that was, I think they call it dropped. That's how they say it now. That's how all the youth talk when things drop on Netflix. I've had a show come out on Netflix uh, called Zero Chill which has actually done incredibly well. It, it's, um, it's based, it's like, it's demographic is teenagers, but there's a lot, there's a lot of other people that aren't teenagers watching that show. Uh, and it's uh, about, well, it's not about ice skating. Ice skating is one of the things, but it's about t to my two children, uh, they're twins, they're both 15. We come back from Canada. I'm English in it, but my husband and my kids are Canadian because one of them, the boy, has got a, an offer of a, an amazing kind of um, ice hockey scholarship, but we have to emigrate and come back to England. So we all come over as a family, but my daughter is also a really good figure skater. So it's about the, the, the mixture of lives between figure skaters and ice hockey players and the angst of what are the consequences and the fallout when you drag your kids across the world and you're, you're basically promoting one of them to do really well because of what he's been offered and what his opportunities are, but you're taking, seemingly taking everything away from the other kid. You know, so that, that, yeah, that's just come out, that came out a couple of weeks ago and I think it's all out at once, isn't it? Because they put, 
they put it all out so you can binge watch it. That's just happened. I hope we shot here. I was really surprised that when you said it, it dropped. I, I took that as in they, you know, put a, it's going. You're not going to do this project. And when, when you were smiling, I was like, okay, you've taken that really well that they've dropped. That. <laughs> Obviously, it's dropped and it's landed on Netflix. That's um, what they, and that's what they'd say. I'd have, I'd have emails or people leave me messages about the date and, and they'd say, and it's going to drop on so-and-so. Like, what? <laughs> what? I'm not. I am old. I've evidently because I'm not quite sure what that means <laughs> <laughs> but you've, you've got that is there anything else because I'm I, I, I know with stuff that uh, new projects you're, you're not always allowed to to reveal it but I know you've just come back from uh from working is that something you're allowed I have, to talk well, this about one, I, yeah this one's okay I've just done a new four-part drama for channel five called teacher what's That's that I'm allowed to say it's um Ooh. Sheridan Sheridan Smith and me and some of the people um but I can't say what it's about but it's a four-part drama and it's intense I can say that it's oh, definitely drama. Not really, much we've got you and Sheridan Smith so you I think you and everybody watching this you've just sold them because you've got two incredible <laughs> actors uh, that have the ability to really connect to, to an audience so that's going to be special so we've got that to look forward to on Netflix anything else there at the moment um, I'm writing. I've started to write. I had to keep myself sane during COVID, as did everybody else. And I just thought, well, you've got to grow your own work. That's what we call it in our house. We've tried to be as productive as possible. Um, so I've, I've just, I'm just starting to venture in the world of putting my projects out there to try and get them made. So writing TV shows, dramas, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've written a um, six-part comedy drama that's finished and that's in the process of being out in the world right now. I've just finished a short film. So, and I'll just continue to keep writing and keep making material. And I'm not quite sure. I think, I don't know. We haven't had the official, we are doing a season two of, of Zero Chill yet. Yeah, that's what it's called, the Netflix show. But if that happens, I'll be pretty busy most of the year because it takes us about seven months to shoot. So apart from that, I don't know. I mean, I just feel I feel really lucky to even be working. Um, well, because it's been insane. I mean, it seems like you've got lots going on. And in regards to the writing, when it comes to writing a TV project uh, and drama, do you vision yourself being in the show or do you write it with you kind of not being being an actor in that because you've kind of got an interest in the sense where you've created this so you're going to want to see it through and make sure it's done correctly but then I guess if you're starring in it as well that takes you away from from that aspect so do you vision yourself being in the the, the, the kind of things you've written yeah of course I do I'd be Life. lying if I didn't. <laughs> I've written I've written every single character for me I'm going to play everyone I'm sorry, my son, my son suddenly got really bright in my room. Be a yeah. sketch. No, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be in it, but again, it's um, I'm very new to the world of getting your own work made, so it will all depend on who who wants to make it and what, and if we can if we can combine our visions of what we want it to be. Well, I've got to say, a massive, I'm honestly so delighted to have you on the show today. So thank you for being so generous with your time and going through all the projects that, you know, some of the projects that you've worked on. I'm really excited for your new project, especially that drama on Channel 5. I think that's going to be... It's going to be a good one. It's intense, up. though. It's not It's not something that you want to watch on, on replay on a Saturday afternoon if you want to feel good about the world. It's, it's full on. <laughs> No, it's incredible. Honestly, thank you so much for, for joining. I know all of your fans, whether it's Holby City, whether it's Sugar Rush, Waterloo Road, they're going to love uh, the fact that we've you know, heard from you and your opinions on the show and your, your time on there and, of course, what's coming next. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis. It's been lovely. Thank you.